D.B. Cooper case solved, but with the solving of the case, there are even more mysteries as to how and why the FBI behaved the way they did. Answers coming up next on Deceptions of the Ages News. everybody and welcome to Deceptions of the Ages News. If you don't know it yet, I am running for the United States Senate and I'm from Washington State running as a new Republican. So if you live in Washington State, go ahead and get involved for on my campaign. Uh, we need uh, plenty of people working, uh, canvassing, uh, going out and knocking on doors and just doing all those political things that people do. So we're getting a lot of support in Washington State and it's really amazing. But people are coming together up here and you're gonna see a Republican go to the Senate from Washington State. It's gonna be awesome. So if you're in Washington State, get on board. If you're out of Washington State, you can still be part of the history-making process that is putting Matthew Hines, which is me, in the Senate. You can order one of these shirts on my website. I'm going to try to get the prices up and have some kind of link to PayPal as soon as possible. All right, with all that out of the way, uh, let's get going on our big mystery, solve it. All right, so the first thing I have to get out of the way is that I assume you understand who D.B. Cooper is and what the mystery is with D.B. Cooper. Now, on May 2nd, I believe it was, a group came forward and named a man by the name of Walter Recca as the D.B. Cooper. And how they identified him as the D.B. Cooper, and remember there has been at least five people that have come forward or that people have identified as D.B. Cooper that uh, have still uh, not completely uh, matched uh, the story. So uh, when these friends of Walter Recca, who is now deceased, came forward, suddenly there were details about the hijacking that came forward with um, his friends that suddenly explained that Walter Recca was D.B. Cooper, or in the words of one of the investigators, he would have been charged with a 1971 hijacking. So of all of the interesting information that has come out of these investigators, and one of them happens to be the uh, niece of Walter Recca and one of his best friends, and also uh, the man working in the bar who was a former law enforcement officer in a town uh, just uh, east of Seattle, Washington. And he claims, and this has been verified, he's a former law enforcement officer, that he was on duty at a bar and Walter Recca came in uh, just an hour after the hijacking had taken place. He was soaking wet and uh, he asked to use the phone. So this man identified Walter Recca as the person who came into the bar and of course the man could not have known that he just hijacked this plane. So according to all the investigation, um, the uh, man, the perpetrator, Walter Recca, uh, hijacked the plane, uh, parachuted, into a place that we'll talk about in a minute, uh, but um, parachuted in, uh, called his friend, his friend came and picked him up, and took him home to a place called Heartline, Washington. Pretty simple operation, right? Until the FBI gets involved. And so that's what we're going to talk about. Because so far, we have heard from the FBI that the, um, the hijacker died in the crash the FBI claimed that the hijacker could have no, no way have spent the money because they were all in marked bills. And uh, they claimed that the plane uh, was headed for Portland. Now, with the death of Walter Recca and his uh, testimony coming forward, we're finding out that all of those things are not true. The first thing, of course, is that Walter Recca did not die in the, uh, in the plane crash or in the uh, hijacking. Number two, they said that he could not have spent the money because it was all uh, in, in uh, serial marked denominations of $20 bills. But uh, according to Walter Recca, that's not true. He said most of the money was very old. And number three, 
uh, that he um, had no way to spend the money was not true because uh, the actual fact is that shortly after the hijacking, uh, Walter Recca crossed the border into Canada, put the money in a safe deposit box, and then uh, with some of it, he bought himself a house, a car, and furniture. So uh, all of these things add up to the fact that the FBI did not tell the truth. Now, here's another detail that came out of the Walter Recca investigation and is going to be supported with what I'm going to tell you at the end of the story. So what we found out from the Walter Recca story is that after his jump, a few weeks later, some men confronted him and they invited him to meet him at a restaurant, at which point they said, we know who you are, do you want to go to prison? And uh, he said, obviously, no. So they said, okay, you work for us. And from that time on, Walter Recca in, was indoctrinated, inducted into a world of, we, I don't even know because they haven't come forward with the details. I'm sure there's going to be a best-selling book and movie about all of this. But Walter Recca had numerous passports. He worked in numerous countries, and he claimed to have worked for so many uh, countries as such as the, the Russian KGB and other places that he said um, he just basically worked for all of them. And so uh, Russia, uh, this, uh, this hijacker suddenly went from uh, being almost a, a petty criminal daredevil uh, to a man on the world scene of espionage. Then we go back to the FBI's suspicious behavior. Now, this is where I must uh, take you back to way back when, and I was a young kid, I was uh, in ninth grade, and I had this uh, really cool social studies teacher, Mr. Cooper. I grew up in a town called Squim, Washington. And so this teacher, uh, one day, you know, I came in after lunch and you're tired and it's hot and he starts passing around this paper and he shows a pic, it's got a picture of D.B. Cooper and he's got these newspaper story clippings that he's copied and he's handed out to everybody. So uh, for the next hour or so, he talks about his brush with D.B. Cooper. So instead of me talking about his brush with D.B. Cooper, let's go ahead and take a look at the actual article. Teacher named Cooper picked the wrong day to ride airplane printed in the Deseret News on November 30th, 1996. Thanksgiving Eve, 1971, the day Northwest Airlines Flight 305 was hijacked by the notorious Michael Cooper. Well, D.B. Cooper. Michael Cooper was the guy sitting a row ahead and the similarity in names for a brief time made the Montana High School Social Studies teacher the most wanted man in America. Afterwards, it scared the devil out of me, he says now. It was a lesson Michael Cooper tells students in how extraordinary things sometimes happen to ordinary people. Northwest Flight 305 left Missoula at 1.13 p.m. on November 24, 1971. Cooper, a 31-year-old teacher at Missoula Sentinel High School, ducked out of school early for the trip to his hometown of Squim, Washington, where he lives and teaches for a family Thanksgiving. The Boeing 727 stopped en route in Spokane, then Portland. There, the man known as D.B. Cooper boarded and took a seat in the last row of the aircraft just behind Michael Cooper. At the time, I thought the guy in the back row was making a pass at the stewardess, he said. All the way from Portland to Seattle, she sat next to him, and they seemed to be in deep conversation. To Mike Cooper's consternation, the plane overflew Seattle and began circling. After a maddening two and a half hours, the plane landed, taxied to the end of the runway, and parked. A fuel truck drove to the right side of the airplane. The first-class stewardess came down the aisle with a cream-colored cotton sack, so heavy that it tipped her backward. It was, Cooper said, very clearly a sack of money, $200,000. Next came parachutes, which the hijacker intended to use, and apparently did use, to jump out of the airplane after it flew off again. Neither the hijacker nor the sack of money has been found in the 25 years since. On the runway at Seattle, however, the passengers knew nothing of the hijacker's plan. They left the plane through the front door and crossed the runway to an airport bus. 
That's when Michael Cooper became entangled with D.B. Cooper. FBI agents were waiting for us in the bus and began to take role of the passengers, Michael Cooper remembered. The agent called D. Cooper and nobody answered. He called again and again. Nobody answered. Finally, I spoke up and said, I am M. Cooper, Michael, and the agent proceeded down the list alphabetically. Later, Cooper realized that the agent had counted D. Cooper as among the passengers on board the bus, but not M. Cooper. When the roll call ended, only M. Cooper remained unaccounted for, the presumed hijacker. The busload of passengers went next to a waiting room where each was interviewed by FBI agents. Michael Cooper spoke with three agents, providing them with his Montana driver's license, telling what he had seen of the man in the last row and was then excused. My sister was at the airport waiting for me, Cooper said. We were supposed to go downtown and pick up my car, which had been shipped from Germany, where I had been a Fulbright exchange teacher the year before. But by then the garage had closed, so my sister dropped me off at her house and went to a party. Alone in his sister's house, Cooper could scarcely believe the events of the afternoon just passed, or what he saw when he switched on the television for the 10 o'clock news. The top news story, of course, was the hijacking, he said. I was watching the footage when one of those messages appeared along the bottom of the screen saying that the FBI was seeking Michael Cooper, a high school teacher from Missoula, Montana, in connection with the hijacking. This can't be true, Cooper said to himself, and I just got up and went to bed. It was just too much for me to deal with, which was, of course, a mistake. Back home in Missoula, telephones were ringing and speculation was rising. Newspaper and radio reporters were on the phone to Cooper's wife. Other callers questioned his parents in squim. No one had heard of Cooper from the plane as after the plane landed, as his sister had no telephone. No, they had to say, they did not know Cooper's whereabouts. The FBI called school administrators, including Don Harbaugh, then assistant principal at Sentinel. But Cooper had not told Harbaugh or Principal Joe Roberts that he was leaving school early. Instead, he had asked another teacher to cover his class. Harbaugh remembers the late night telephone call. The FBI agent was most emphatic. He said they had positive identification that Mike Cooper had hijacked an airplane between Seattle and Portland. My brain was reeling, Harbaugh said. I remember thinking, you mean Mike Cooper checked out of school early to hijack an airplane? Say what? By then, the account was being broadcast over Missoula radio stations, and there was considerable speculation. People were talking about how Mike's car was over in Seattle and how someone saw him make a withdrawal at the bank and how he hadn't told us about leaving school early, Harbaugh said. Within a day, the news reports changed the identity of the hijacker to D.B. Cooper, but there was never a follow-up or apology, either to school administrators or to Michael Cooper. I expected at least a comment about why the error was made, Cooper said, but I never heard anything. There was, however, endless harassing when Cooper returned to Sentinel, Sentinel the following Monday morning, Harbaugh said. We had no mercy. For months we called him D.B. Cooper began telling the story of Flight 305 while he was still at Sentinel and continued when he moved home to Squim. In his 20 years at Squim High School, the storytelling has been an annual event shared now by two generations of students, parents, and children alike. The tale is also, Cooper said, a cautionary one. You can't predetermine the things that happen. Every time I get on an airplane, I wonder if something unusual is going to happen. Sometimes kids think that big things happen only to famous people, he said, but I'm just an ordinary school teacher with an extraordinary story. So from Mike Cooper's account, my former social studies teacher, we have a very interesting and suspicious uh, activity on the part of the FBI. Because as, the, as he said, when he got off the plane, he told that they were looking for an, a D. Cooper. And he told them, I am M. Cooper. And so they specifically wrote that down. Now, do you think these people who are trained in law enforcement, who are most likely attorneys themselves, who are used to dealing with evidence 
and getting everything straight, how could they possibly have made a mistake between a D.B. Cooper and a Mike Cooper? So obviously that is not really possible. And so we have to look at the chain of events because he identified himself as M. Cooper and then that was noted and passed to higher authorities. But immediately it went out on the press, in the press, that they were searching for Mike Cooper, which did what? It gave D.B. Cooper another at least day to get away. So what did the FBI do? Um, they uh, allowed Cooper to get away, but they also did another thing in uh, not only looking for the wrong man, but according to Walter Recca's testimony, uh, the man who, was, who he met uh, in the bar and the, and the man whose testimony says he met Walter Recca in the bar was uh, just shy of the town of Clay Ellum, which is not south, but is actually east of Seattle. So from the beginning, the FBI had all of the police and law enforcement and search and rescue assets concentrated in southwestern Washington around the I-5 corridor between there and Mount St. Helens, when actually D.B. Cooper uh, jumped out of the plane near Clay Ellum and went to a cafe from there. So there are three things that the FBI did. Uh, they, by saying that he was dead, by having the search conducted in the wrong operation, and having them searching for the wrong man, they specifically allowed D.B. Cooper to get away. And as we know from the uh, testimony and the evidence presented by Walter Recca, they did that because they were going to use him as some kind of a super agent. Well, it's an exciting story, and I certainly can't wait for the movie. So we'll see you next time on Deceptions of the Ages News.